and welcome to our uh, panel on philosophy, topography, and history. We have three intriguing talks uh, we will have them all in a row, and uh, I ask you to hold any questions uh, until the end. There will be plenty of time uh, to discuss uh, all the presentations here. And we're starting off with uh, Philip Zeifert. He is a political philosopher uh, with a PhD in political science. His thesis was on Oscar K. Lewin's Utopian Science Fiction. Uh, he is currently doing research on philosophical anthropology, uh, which leads us right into his uh, lecture, Utopian Perspectives, what philosophical anthropology can tell us about self-reflexivity and authority. Thank you and good morning to you all. Utopia is a literary tool to imagine a better or even perfect world. And in the fictional society we can find justice, equality, freedom, order, piety, wisdom, affluence, beauty and any number of values that the author deems precious. And the lack of these values in the real world is criticized. Very often, the evils of the real world are depicted as, uh, as a consequence of arbitrariness and irrationality. And consequently, most classical utopias use rationality as a means to escape society's evils. Utopia is a rational society, and it is good precisely because it is rational. If there is a king in Utopia, he is not despotic, but rules in a good way, following rational rules. Therefore, it is not important who is Utopia's king. Actually, kings do not even seem to be necessary. Take Gabriel de Fournier's the southern land known from 1676 as an example. You see a different name, a different uh, title, but it's this book. Um, <laughs> yeah, really. Um, here, the utopian Australians do not know hierarchy and command, but still they work together like a well-designed machinery. The thoughts and wills of true men Quote, being perfectly unified are the same without any difference. It suffices to explain them once in order for them to be embraced without opposition, just as reasonable people follow a true path with pleasure once it is pointed out to them. End quote. I think that this kind of non-discursive consensus and rational compliancy is quite creepy and one of the roots of totalitarianism in the utopian tradition. Let's contrast this to another description of Australia, Joseph Hall's Mundus Alter et Idem, maybe from 1605. He fantasizes about countries ruled by gluttons, drunkards, women and fools, that is, in Hall's understanding, by irrational people. The rulers do follow rules, uh, but these are irrational too. Mundus Alter et Idem is a funny book, and its irrationality does not really solve any real-world problems. Normally, this book is categorized as a satire, not utopia. Maybe rationality is a defining character of utopia, but rationality defines the one right way and closes off all alternatives. Which, uh, with, re with rationality, you do not have a choice except, of course, this so-called rational choice, which amounts to extortion, is no choice at all. So, is utopia fucked by rationality? <laughs> it is difficult to argue against rationality because anti-rational arguments tend to become irrational and therefore not being arguments at all. But there is a trick, a loophole of rationality. In strict axiomatic logical systems, self-referentiality is a useful bomb in the pocket of the subversive with the black hat. 
Consider the liar paradox. I am lying right now. There you have a self-referential sentence that can neither be true nor false, thereby escaping the confines of propositional logic. I want to destroy a kind of strict axiomatic logical system and I'm going to use a kind of self-referentiality. I'm looking for self-reflexivity in literary utopias. It is crucial to look at the right place for self-reflexivity and this means that there have to be certain perspective in the utopian narrative to, um, to enable the paradoxes that destroy rational purity. I will claim that the citizen of Utopia can be the author of Utopia. A character in a book has to somehow crawl out of the book and write or rewrite the book herself, thereby gaining her own authority. What she destroys by this seemingly impossible and obviously illogical act is the traditional rationalist utopia she once had to live in. And this may sound illogical, but actually this is the way we humans function according to philosophical anthropology. But let's first look, an, uh, look at an example. Thomas More's utopia from 1516 has often been lauded for the ironic self-reflexivity in the text and especially in the paratext. It starts with some letters with, uh, in which uh, Thomas More questions the accuracy of what is written in the book itself. I cannot get into details here. Um, please read Thomas Schölderle's excellent article in the latest issue of the Zeitschrift für Fantastik Forschung. Yeah. Um, and in the frame story, uh, Thomas More again appears as a character uh, that does not really believe in the reality or even desirability of the social institutions on the island Utopia. And the name of the Utopian traveler, Raphael Heifrodei, can be translated as a blatherer of nonsense. So the narrative authority is subverted by the fine and learned irony of the humanist more. This irony is a kind of self-reflexivity. Self the book questions the trueness of the book. But the main body of the text is just a monologue of Heifrodei about the roles, institutions, and structures, and laws of utopia. We do not hear even one utopian talk. We hear that they are all happy, but can we believe this? The complete absence of politics, public discourse, or dissidence might sound as a proof of happiness, but the opposite is true. The manner of storytelling makes utopia inherently authoritarian. What I would have liked to hear is the story of outsiders, rioters, or punk rockers in utopia. <laughs> Utopias that silence these perspectives are always very suspect to me, and I will present you philosophical anthropological reasons for this. Several philosophers are important, but I do not have time for all of them. So today I will omit Gustav Landauer's open-ended philosophy of topie and utopie, Ernst Bloch's closed philosophy of utopian hope, and Arnold Gehlen's Mengelwesen theory of uncritical acceptance of institutions. Instead, I will concentrate on Helmut Plessner's dialectical philosophy of eccentric positionality. Dialectics is one of philosophy's most subversive assets. It dissolves being into becoming, thereby submitting perfection to sublation, that is Hegel's Aufhebung. And let me explain this. Plessner starts with a definition of life. Yes, a universal definition of life as realizing one's borders. Every object ends somewhere in space, okay? And we can call, for example, this red line um, the surface area uh, where everything that constitutes the object is in it, whilst everything else, the environment, is outside. 
Um, this red line does not belong to the object or the environment. It's just a mental thing that we need. Uh, or if you draw comics, you know, uh, black lines at the side of the faces. We do not really have black uh, lines. We, we just need him to think about them. Living object, on the other hand, you see, it's almost the same object, but it lives. It doesn't have a red line. It has a blue line. And this blue line is the border, N not a surface area. It's a real border. And... Living things must realize this border to stay alive, to remain a living system. While stones remain stones even when smashed to pieces, living objects that fail to maintain their border or to heal when injured are no longer living objects. Having and realizing a border is a dialectical action because the border must at the same time um, ward off change and facilitate change. The border moves the creature beyond itself while simultaneously standing against itself. Humans have a special way of uh, positioning themselves against their environment. Uh, they are in their border, looking out of their border, out of their body, um, but at the same time they reflect on this and are thus also outside their body. Plessner calls this biological self-reflexivity eccentric positionality and derives three fundamental anthropological laws from it. Um, first, the law of natural artificiality, which means that by nature humans need society, but society for humans is always artificial. Second, the law of mediated mediated immediacy, which means that humans cannot express themselves immediately, but they need the medium of conscience, so they have to artificially create means of expression, for example, their society or plans or narrations of it. And third, uh, the law of the utopian position, uh, which means that humans always are at a no place, a, a place that goes beyond the here and now. So humans are never finished or completely at home. That makes them utopists that have the innate propensity to criticize and make anew the social condition they find themselves in. For humans, it is impossible to escape estrangement and no institutional arrangement or perfect society can change that. If you decide to invent a good society um, for humans, you have to remember that this society is for people who will invent good societies themselves. Utopians are utopists, or they are not human at all. The means of human uh, utopism is storytelling. By telling stories, we define who we are, what we expect from each other, uh, and how we can make sense of our sensory input. Storytelling constructs our perspective on the world and the values that inform our conduct. But the power to tell stories about society and about our roles is not distributed equally. The crucial question is who is able and allowed to tell stories? And who defines the utopia we live in? Either only a few people or maybe even just one person uh, is allowed to interpret social reality and social dreaming. Uh, then this person is the sole author and has full authority. I call this kind of storytelling closed utopian storytelling. Or you have many people, potentially even all people, uh, to have a say in defining what is and what ought to be. Authority, understood as being an author and having power, is distributed equally. Anyone can join the team of storytellers. Therefore, I call this kind of utopian storytelling open. I think that open utopian storytelling is more appropriate for humans. And if someone wants to close the authorship and force me to recite only his story, I can still subvert his power by slightly changing his story. The end state is impossible. So, to tell a utopian story that is open, I must allow others to join in the storytelling. And in particular, the citizen of my utopia um, have to have a say. In classical utopias, the number of utopians that are allowed to talk is very small, uh, as if to prevent objections or dis dissent. 
As readers, we only hear positive propaganda. Just look at Thomas More's Utopia, where the traveller Heifelday and his dialogue partner, Thomas More himself, reflect on the social institutions on the island Utopia, while only Thomas More and maybe his pen pal reflect on the utopian text itself. Um, classical utopias typically consist of long, systematic dialogues where a kind of governmental tourist guide explains all social institutions to a delighted traveler. Um, in a variation of this, there can be a monologue of the traveler or a pseudo-story in which nothing happens but everything is explained. And this makes these texts so discursive and, and so, so dull. Um, then there are the classical dystopias. You get to know those nasty dissidents that want to escape or change the world. Examples for this should be well known. Sam Yatin Tsui, Huxley's Brave New World, Orwell's 1984, and so on. These dystopias do not take the perspective of the governments, but of the subjects, of the subjected individuals. We hear, we hear the voices and even read the minds of D503, Bernard Marx, and Winston Smith. They are not mere role-bearers, although their societies would do anything to reduce their personality to their roles. D503 should be just a computing number. Bernard Marx is farmed to be part of the functional sub-elite, and Winston Smith is submitted to total control so that he obeys commands and helps to erase history. But these techniques of subordination do not work properly all protagonists eventually start to dream of alternatives or change. They are real humans because they are utopists. The classical dystopias are not discursive, but they are real novels, even science fiction novels. But there seems to be a dilemma. Either good society is depicted as a perfect heaven, but implausibly so, because it is closed and the utopians have a non-credible attitude towards their society, or good society is shown to really be a hell by plausible psychology of its citizens. It is, uh, is it impossible to imagine a society that is both good and open for criticism by its own citizens? The classical dystopia seem to have smashed the project of literary positive utopia. But wait. There is some science fiction we should have a look at. Uh, from the mid-1970s on, uh, there appear the critical utopias and critical dystopias. They carry forward the critical stance of the citizens toward their dystopian societies, while at the same time giving them utopian hopes and desires. Some of them let their protagonists explicitly discuss alternative social orders, even reflect on the utopian discourse itself. Others open themselves up to the reader who may help to construct and deconstruct utopian designs. These utopias are novels too, although sometimes with an experimental or unusual narrative style. I was hoping to find video games that use uh, their responsiveness to the player to engage them in such constructive reflections and thus play with utopian perspectives, but I have not found them yet. Let's look at a few examples for literary utopias that allow the inhabitants to make full use of their eccentric positionality. The first example is Kim Stanley Robinson's Pacific Edge from 1990. It is the third part of his Three Californias trilogy. These three books depict three alternative versions of a future California, which in a sense already opens this utopia up. In Pacific Edge, we get to learn about not a perfect, but a better society. Better here means greener, more ecological. But it is still a society with conflict on the personal and political level. Debates about political decisions are one of the major themes of the book. Another theme is an extensive discussion about what role literary utopias and utopian visions generally can play in social change. Since Pacific Edge is itself a utopia, it is at least as self-referential and ironic as Moore's utopia. And it makes some of the characters into the authors of utopia as they fight about the future path of their community. Then there is the interesting case of Chris Carlson's After the Deluge from 2004. 
It depicts uh, an anarchist society, the flooded city of San Francisco in the year, not 20, but 2154. It's a, a, a typo. Um, there is a criminal plot at the center of the story, but it is not a thriller. It is rather a juxtaposition of two opposing perspectives on the social order of San Francisco. There, on the one hand, you have a utopian traveler, Eric, who learns to love the city and its institutions. Eventually, he becomes a public investigator, a profession that resembles something of an anarchist policeman. And he tries to fight off terrorist arson and protect the anarchist order. In the novel, there's also, on the other hand, a dystopian outsider, the adolescent Nguyen, uh, depicted on the, uh, on the cover. Um, Nguyen is the arsonist who hates the way society functions and the expectations it has of him. He tries to change society, if necessary, by violence. You can understand both of them. So is this San Francisco a utopia or a dystopia? Uh, I think it's both. The protagonists feel very differently about it. One becomes a kind of anarchist conservative, the other um, one an anti-anarchist revolutionary. They both uh, try to make themselves author of future San Francisco. I'm a bit in a hurry, so let's get very fast to the third and last example. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Always Coming Home, her second utopia from 1985. Uh, there's a future society that is also a traditional society, indigenous society, um, where the people are not only reproducers, but producers. Uh, they discuss how they want to have the future in the society in the future. But the interesting thing is that the reader is an author of this uh, book, because only a fifth of the book is told in a novel-like form, and the rest is a mess of different texts, myths, stories, poems, plays, songs, tables, recipes, maps, a dictionary, and so on. And so you have, if you read it, you have to construct this utopian society yourself and you become a homo utopicus. And by the way, uh, there's some theory behind it. I omit this now too. Uh, so looking at these cases, uh, you see that all critical utopias are science fiction novels, while the classical utopias are not novels at all. They are fictional and some are kind of scientific, but they are not science fiction, uh, but boring question answer sessions about utopian institutions. The critical utopias all have exciting stories with plot and development, just like good uh, science fiction should be. The psychology of the characters are, is plausible, roles and institutions are rated as both good and oppressive, and crucially, we hear both the affirmative and subversive voices of the citizens of utopia that are so typical human. Utopian perspectives are the perspectives of the utopians. Compare the people in classical and in critical utopias. You will find that the discontents and dreamers seem to be more plausible than the blissfully happy dopes. And I contend that the reason for this is that they really are. Be realistic, demand the impossible. A corollary to this is that Tina is dead, but you already know this. Um, since societies change, you may want to have a say about how and in which direction it should change, but can you even imagine another, a vastly different society? If not, that's sad. But it is not, no proof for the lack of alternative, it is just a sign for weak imagination. Uh, so practice your power of imagination and imagination will become powerful. You might even realize that you are a homo utopicus. Thank you. Thank you.